Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Well, good morning and welcome. Like Sean said, first Sunday of 2018. How are you guys feeling? Good. Okay. Okay. I know there's a lot of sickness going on around here, so it's good you guys are doing good. It's good you guys are doing good. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Jacob. I have the privilege of uh, being one of the pastors here this morning and kicking off our new series that we're doing, uh, starting today for the next couple weeks. And uh, if you guys are in need of a Bible, if you forgot yours or someone next to you stole it, there's a couple of them going around, a couple of them going around. If you don't have one at home or even, you know, if you need one to take to give to someone else, be our guest. It's a gift to you. So question for you guys this morning, best way to start out the new year, right, is with a question. What is something that God has been doing for eternity past and will be doing for eternity future? What's something he's been doing eternity past and will once more continue to be doing eternity future? Existing. Okay. These are all good answers. Good answers. We, we might be tempted to say something like forgiving, right? Which is something that is core to who God is, but it's not something that he's actually been practicing for eternity past, right? Only so long as he's had subjects in need of forgiveness, right? So he's forgiving, but he hasn't always been doing it, right? Or say mercy, something like that. But once again, he needs subjects in need of mercy to actually act out mercifully towards, right? So we could mix it up a little bit, think outside of like the moral realm or something, and say something like creating. Has God been creating for eternity past, eternity future? No, no once again, right? I mean, best we know, uh, he started creating at a certain point in time when he created time, right? And so we could go with like the most basic one of all that we would think of. What would that be? I think I heard it. Love, right? Has God been loving eternity past and eternity future? Well, yes, he certainly has, right? But I'm thinking uh, not just that, the, the action of love, but really the arena, the, the atmosphere in which love can take place, if you will. Something God's been doing for eternity past and will continue to do for eternity future is this. He has been living in community. He's been living in community forever. Like, that's something that is core to who God is. His very essence is that God lives in community. It, it's, a, it's a Trinitarian value, if you will. Something God has always been doing is practicing community. For, I mean, forever and ever. This is basic to who God is. Basic as a Trinitarian value. And the Trinity is one of those things in Christianity that's so easy to overcomplicate, right? Right? I like to try and wrap our minds around a paradox and think we got it figured out with all these little diagrams or figures or whatever. It's something that seems so complex, but at its core, at its root, it is so simple. God lives in community. And that same community, as a matter of fact, is motivation for your very existence. I mean, God created you to bear his image, to, to reflect who God is, to make God known to others. I mean, community is, is, is part of the essence of why you were created, to make God known to others. And to, to do that by knowing God, being in relationship, in community with him. It's something basic and core to who we are. And you can't do it alone, right? <laughs> you can't do community alone. Like, image is to be reflected not solely by men or women, but actually both male and female together is what reflects image. So community demands that we do it together as much as it is done together, right? It's part of who we are. And yet the question is, if it's so core to who God is, and it's so essential for, for why we even exist, how are we doing at it? A friend of mine, a name you've probably heard, Dr. Rick Taylor, uh, in a book that he published, he, he writes this. He says, people tend to live in their own little box worlds that revolve around them. You move from your house box to your car box to your office box and may not have to interact with many people in the transitions. Then you leave the office box, you get in the car box and go to the home box. You close the door to the garage box before you get out of the car box so that you don't actually have to say hello to the neighbor who's taking out the trash box. You see how this is going? And then he begins to apply it for us. He says, marriages end in divorce at alarming rates. What's even scarier is how many couples live under the same roof with only a marriage license in common. 
I mean, how many children spend their time at home in their rooms with their doors closed perpetually? How many stay after work late so that they don't have to relate to someone at home? How many join clubs and have hobbies that allow them to go do their own thing without having to interact in a meaningful way with anyone that they don't want to? Does this sound like our culture to you? How are we doing at community? You know, our culture, there's so many dangers that it puts right in front of us. Dangers that try and steal the joy and commitment that we could have to community and instead move the focus inward, right? One of those dangers is that of isolation, And I don't mean like moving to Montana and buying, you know, 600 acres and camping out by yourself, having Amazon like airdrop everything to you, right? Not that kind of isolation, but this is actually like an isolation around people because many of us, we live in a community, don't we? But that's different than actually living in community. There's a difference between living in a community and living in community. I remember my time in Chicago, right? Just in uh, Chicago... Um, specifically, there's 2.7 million people, right? I spent three years of my life there, and those were like the three loneliest years of my life. 10 million people in Chicago proper. I was surrounded by so many people, but just being around people doesn't actually equate with doing life in community. Or some of the neighborhoods you guys might live in, like if you live in the Quail Oaks community, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually living in community, You've seen the same stuff, like when you go to Starbucks or a restaurant, and there'll be like six people in line, right? They have a straighter line than you could have done in third grade, right? Without even trying. And yet, they're all doing what? They're like looking down at their phones, this sort of thing. I mean, they're all in proximity to each other, but they're not in community with each other. Same thing you find in lines in stores, like you find at stoplights too, right? (laughs) Everyone's in a straight line and looking down, right? We just don't feel safe with that kind of an environment. But too often, like these sorts of things describe us, isolation is one of these dangers. We give in to, if you will, what we call a pseudo-community, a pseudo-community. We live uh, around people, um, but it looks something like this. It's the type of place where there's mere tolerance of other people, right? I mean, we have acquaintances, but we don't really know people's names, so what do we do? Hey, buddy. Did you guys ever do that? <laughs> you don't know people's names, so you just call people buddy or, or, or stud, right? That's my worst one. Um, and it, it's in these like pseudo communities that we find ourselves harboring bitterness. We have a proclivity towards non-commitment, right? Even on Facebook, we have the maybe button in case something better comes up, right? It's like we might want to be somewhere else. We're not committed to this sort of a community. Uh, we find uh, resents there. There's boredom there. We talk about the weather, and if we do talk about anything deeper than the weather, it's generally gossip and putting other people in the community down, right? The kind of place where it's about me and my ego. It's marked by selfishness and exclusivity. There's cliques, there's groups. So again, we live in proximity. We call it a community, but really what it is is a pseudo-community. Whereas biblical community looks very different. If we could, we could call it a real or an authentic community community. It's marked by kind of humble service, by honesty with one another. It's a community that's marked by prayer. And instead of just independence, it's this interdependence where we're vulnerable with each other. There's forgiveness that we extend towards one another. There's authentic friendships, right, where everyone knows your name, right? God's word is central in this kind of a community. It's marked by sacrificial generosity, where we steward our need, everything that we have, our resources, time, talents, and treasures for the benefit of others. There's an uh, inclusivity, where everyone's welcome, but no one's going to go unchallenged. It's marked by celebration, by joy, and by worship. That's what biblical community looks like. Yet too often we settle for pseudo-community as we isolate ourselves from other people. Another danger to what authentic community is 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 the the Western value that we praise, the value of individualism. You guys familiar with this? Where we've personalized everything, right? You do you. You look out for number one. Do your own thing. What's the mantra for Burger King? Have it your way, right? I mean, individualism, it's even in our food, right? Like, it's seeped down to every part of us. I mean, right, even in our nation, we celebrate independence, where it's about me and us and my freedom. 
And the same sort of value is something that is seeping into the church, and it's a danger Because we've isolated Christianity to, instead of becoming something about us, it's about me and my relationship with God. You guys ever hear that? Christianity is something I do. It's about me and my relationship with God. We've made it both personal and also private. I mean, one of the most common New Year's resolutions amongst Christians isn't just the gym, right? But it's like, man, this year I'm going to double down on my devos, right? I'm going to be so much more intentional, (laughs) you know? I'm going to at least get to chapter 7, right? And we make it about just me and my relationship with God. And I have absolutely nothing against personal devotions, right? I mean, even Jesus got a way to be with the Father, so we are all for that. But what if one of the best investments that we could make not just this year, but I mean every day of our life is the investment in other people, in living out biblical community. I mean, what if our church looked like that? You guys, we could go all the way back to the garden, and the very first sin was a lure into independence. I mean, the very first sin back in Genesis 1 was an attack on community. You can be your own God, says the serpent. You don't need anyone else. I mean, the horrific and immediate consequences of that choice were brokenness in community. Brokenness between man and God and between man and woman. Brokenness with God and and brokenness with one another. And it's a brokenness that we know the taste of all too well down to this very day. The lure to be about me instead of about us. So it's no surprise um, that this would be difficult, though, right? I mean, we don't want to live in community because it's hard to do that, right? I mean, maybe some of you guys, you've heard the story about the fishermen, right? They set out uh, one morning, and the wind kind of blows them a little bit off course, so they come around an uninhabited island and decide to cast their nets there. And it's there that they, they see smoke coming from shore on, uh, on the island, right? And it's an uninhabited island, so of course, curious, what would you do? You pull up ashore, the fishermen in their little boat, and it's there that they're surprised to find that there's a man who's been stranded on the island for four months, all by himself. You can imagine the scratch, you know, maybe this is the image, right? (laughs) Should have gotten a haircut a while back, and the beard's come a little too much, right? You can imagine the image, and so it's upon rescuing him and inviting him to the ship that they they take off from shore, and, and as they're leaving behind them, they see just before the tree line, three huts, Three huts, you know, that's a curious thing. So they ask the man, so what's with the three huts? And he tells them, well, the the one on the left there, there, that was my house. And the one on the right, well, that was my church. And the one in the middle, well, that's the church I used to go to. (laughs) That's too often what community comes down to for us, right? It's so hard, so we're so quick to run. We don't even need an excuse, right? But we run away from community. So it should come as no surprise to us, however, that the most common metaphor in the New Testament for the church by the Apostle Paul is that of the body of Christ. It's this image of the church as a body, a unified whole working in conjunction, where each part contributes. It contributes towards its own needs and the needs of those around. I mean, even in your faces, right? It takes 10 muscles to just like smirk the smallest smile right? A little like corners go up sort of thing. Like 10 muscles in your face have to work just to do one little smile. There's 26 bones in each foot that have to work in conjunction in unison just to walk around. 26 bones. And this is the the metaphor that Paul chooses for the church, the body, where every part contributes and has a part to play, a unified whole. And if you neglect any part individually, then you compromise you compromise the strength of the whole. I mean, can you imagine training uh, as an athlete for um, the Olympics or something like that, right? And you focus on having one of the fastest legs in the world, right? (laughs) Just one, like what good is that gonna do you? Or maybe some of you guys, you've seen the meme, friends don't let friends miss leg day. Have you guys seen that? If you haven't, the image is, is one of like a dude uh, working out at a gym and he's kind of standing there and you can imagine like Pete's upper torso, right? Like he's as thick as I am wide, right? Like he's got traps that could just like lift up Everest, right? And that's this dude. But then his legs are like my torso down, right? <laughs> and it's this image of like Everest on toothpicks, right? 
And the idea of like friends don't let friends skip leg day, because what happens? If you focus all of your attention on part of the body and neglect another part, you compromise the strength of the whole. If part of the body is just gonna take a couple years off, it's not gonna work how God designed it, is it? And this is how community is to work. It's to work together. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse 12 says that, though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's in community that's in unity that we find strength. And not just like intertwined relationships, right? I mean, just intertwining with other people, um, the people that you may cross paths with on a daily basis, as, that's, as far as you go, does not result in stability or effectiveness, necessarily, right? Just intertwining with other people. Just recall your last game of Twister, right? Just twisting up your life with other people's lives doesn't result in stability or effectiveness, God had something else in mind, community. So the question at hand this morning is how important is community to God? How important is community to God? And then I want us to look a little bit at a picture of what that community can look like, an image that's given to us in the New Testament. Would you guys turn with me to John chapter 17? John chapter 17. This is, uh, if you guys are Bible snobs, this is the real Lord's Prayer, okay? We often talk about the Lord's Prayer when he's teaching the disciples how to pray, but that's more the disciples' prayer, right? This is the real Lord's Prayer, if you want to be a Bible snob, where we get to be a fly on the wall hearing Jesus pray to his Father. Not teaching us how to pray, but actually praying for us. It's an awesome chapter in the Gospel of John, but then which one isn't, right? Um, John chapter 17. Look at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Just like the disciples' prayer here, he prays to the Father, and he says that the hour has come. And if we'd been reading through the Gospel of John together, Jesus is frequently talking about the hour or my time has not yet come, but here he says the time has come. The hour has come. Well, the hour for what? The hour for the passion of the Christ. The hour where Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection are now imminent. And he says, this hour has come, so in this, in the crucifixion, glorify your son, so that the son may glorify you. And there's this reciprocal relationship that we already see going on. He's addressing the father, and he's asking that he might be glorified. But in the context, his glory is his crucifixion, his humiliation. His glory is not about his ego. It's not self-centered, but it's actually other-centered. It's father-centered. And there's this reciprocal thing that's going on saying, glorify me in my humiliation so that you would be glorified. And it's humiliation at the cross because it's through that humiliation, that glory, as Jesus calls it, that he's going to accomplish a mission. And it's a very specific mission. Look at verse two. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. You see, just as the purpose of Christ receiving glory was to give glory to the Father, so also the purpose of verse 2 of his receiving this authority is to give eternal life. The purpose of his glory was the glory of the Father, and the purpose of this authority being given to him was to give something away, eternal life. Well, what is this authority that Jesus receives? A couple different options. Some people would say, well, it's his rightful authority as God. But if it's his rightful authority, then it seems a little bit strange that it's something that the Father gives to him. It kind of disqualifies the gift nature of it. Plus, this authority here seems like it's something that's a little unique to the Son. So it doesn't just seem to be his authority as God. So another idea is that, well, it could be his, uh, it's a reward for his obedience, And whereas Christ has been obedient up to this point, he hasn't completed all of his obedience. So it's a little preemptive if it's a reward in that sense that it would be already given. Instead, it seems to best understand this authority as the authority that Jesus needs to accomplish his mission. His mission of giving eternal life. 
And this authority is given to him uh, considering his prospective obedience. Expecting Christ to finish out through the end, the authority is given to him that he needs to accomplish that mission. That mission that I believe the Father gave the Son was the mission of redemption. To expand, if you will, um, the circle of God's community. To restore lost sinners, to open the door to invite them back in. To invite us back in who had cast ourselves from community with God had chased after our own wants and desires and had broken fellowship with God and with others. Jesus has given the authority to accomplish the mission of opening the door for us back into community with God. I believe this is the mission because I think it's spelled out when Jesus defines eternal life in verse three. Look there. And this is eternal life. It's just a fascinating verse. Jesus is praying to the Father, telling the Father what eternal life is, right? Do you think God didn't know? The father was like, oh, that's what it is, right? No, it's meant for us to go, oh, that's what it is, right? The father didn't need to know this. We need to know this. This is what eternal life is. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. This is what eternal life is, church. Eternal life is not a mere quantity of life. It's not life for a long, long time. It's not life for all ages to come. It's not only that. It's not just a quantity of life. Eternal life is a quality of life. A quality of life in which I don't mean you have lots of possessions and all your needs are always taken care of. You have a big house and a fancy car. Not that kind of a quality of life a quality of life in which you are invited back into community with God, in which a door is open for you to enter back into community with God and with one another. This is eternal life, that you know the only true God and Jesus Christ. Eternal life is a quality of life, a type of life in community with God, and as we'll see, that opens the door back into authentic community with one another. This is eternal life, knowing God. And Jesus says he accomplished exactly this in verse four. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And then now it's through this new community that he's welcoming back into knowing God. They're restored to God through Jesus the son. Look at verse six, six through eight. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. They've received them. They've come to know in truth that I came from you. And they believe that you sent me. This is a new community that Jesus is establishing of those who have been restored into community with knowledge of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. As we continue through this passage, we're going to begin to see three common threads that weave this community together. Three threads that weave this community together. The first one, thread one, if you will, is a common experience which unites them. We'll find in this community a common experience which always unites them, and it is the experience of eternal life. We would also call this today in our Christian news like it's faith. It's the experience of salvation of becoming a Christian, like actually being united into relationship, community with God. It's the experience which unites them is that of eternal life, of believing who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. If you believe those things, then you are invited into this community of knowing God. Believe who Jesus is, that he's the anointed Messiah, the Lord, that the Father sent to accomplish the mission of redemption to pay the penalty of our sins and invite us back into righteous living with God. It's one thread that always unites this kind of a community. It's a common experience of faith in who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. That belief then ushers this new community for which Jesus is praying. It ushers people in. It invites them in. Look at verse 9. Jesus says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I'm glorified in them. 
See this community that's being built of those who put their faith in believing who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish? And that leads from the first thread into the second thread. As a thread that is godly, distinct lives begin to distinguish them. Godliness, distinct, righteous lives begin to distinguish this community. It's a thread of godliness that weaves through them all. Look at verse 11. He says, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This godliness, this righteous living begins to distinguish them in verse 11 in the the context of unity. In verse 12, it marks them in that there are people who hold tightly to Jesus. In verse 13, they're a community which experiences authentic joy. In verse 14, we find that God's word is central. And so they're despised by the world because they value the things of God. In verse 15, they're preserved in that godliness. In verse 16, it's the stark contrast between what they look like and what the world looks like. All the way to verse 17, that they are people who are sanctified by God's word. They are marked by the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do. These distinctives begin to mark them godliness that set them apart from the other communities of the world. But it raises a question for us. If Jesus' mission was to reunite people into community with God, and it's seemingly accomplished here, then why does he not take us with him? If his goal was to to reestablish us into community with God, here he says back in verse 11 that I'm coming, but they're not coming yet. So the question arises, well, what are we still here for, right? And the simple answer is, man, there's still work to be done. It's the third thread that begins to weave this community together is that we have a common mission which propels us. We have a common mission which is going to propel us forward. Look at verse 18 of John chapter 17. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. All right, well, how did God send Jesus into the world? For what purpose? For what mission? To give eternal life, right? That's why Jesus came into the world, was to give eternal life, knowing the Father and the Son, bringing us back into community with God. And he says, now it's the same mission for which I send them out into the world, to offer eternal life, to invite others into that same life, that community with God of knowing the Father and the Son. Jesus says, that's what I'm sending them out for. The same thing you sent me out for. Verse 19, he says, it's for their sake that I consecrate myself. I set myself aside on this mission for them that they also might be sanctified in truth. I was set apart to accomplish this mission on their behalf with the intent now that they would go and do the same. They would spread that truth. And so now it becomes that the the trajectory of Christ's mission is not one which ends with you, but actually one which now continues to work through you to invite others in. So this community doesn't stop here. We have a trajectory to go and to invite others in just as Jesus came in pursuit of us. Now we go in pursuit of others. I mean, Jesus expects this community to grow. Look at the next verse, verse 20. He says, I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. His expectation is then that they would go and be witnesses of this reality, reunited into community with God and one another, and we would invite others in. He says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. People are united in a common experience of belief in who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. Then we're made distinct by lives that value the things of God, a life that reflects being in relationship with God, and then we have a common mission to make God known and invite others in. Church, this is why God came. This is why Jesus was born in a manger, was to invite us back in a community with the Father, an eternal value of his for which you exist this very day, to live in community with God and with one another. This is why you're here. This is what you were made for, life with God. I mean, what can that look like? 
What should that look like? To be living your life with the Creator? Church, that's who you are. A people who have been ushered back in to relationship with God. Back into the same community of the Trinity that God created you for. He values you that much that even before creation, he gave his son authority to accomplish that work on your behalf because God wants you to be in community with him. It's what we're here for. In the New Testament, they give us a picture of what this kind of community ought to look like. It's the purpose that we're doing the series that we are for the next couple weeks is, is to flesh out the, the marks, the distinctions of what that community ought to be doing. The picture of this in the New Testament is first appearing in the book of Acts. Would you guys turn with me there? The Jerusalem church becomes for us a model of what this kind of community ought to look like. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Um, <clears throat> Luke, he talks about the gospel that he had written ahead of time. And he says that it's in that gospel that he talked about what Jesus began to do. It sets up for us a little bit of what the book of Acts is all about. Now that Jesus, um, he's about to ascend back into heaven, the idea in the book of Acts is now what Jesus is continuing to do. What Jesus is continuing to do is fleshed out in the book of Acts that started in the gospels. We find in the beginning of the book of Acts that Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the son, went to go back and to be with the father, but before he leaves, he says, I'm going to send the helper. I'm going to send empowerment for you to live out this kind of community that I'm inviting you into. I'm not leaving you alone. It's not the community of God up here, and you guys just now develop your own little community. God, through his Holy Spirit, comes and abides within this community. And Jesus says he promises the Holy Spirit. It's this empowerment for the mission that lies ahead of us. And then Jesus ascends into heaven, and the disciples, they're all there, like staring at the clouds, right? And then these two men come and stand beside them, and they're like, what are you guys looking at, you know? And Jesus disappeared, or however that worked, and they go tell him, they hit, like, man, he's going to be coming back just like he left. And so all the disciples, they gather together, they go, and they gather in, in one room together, and they just spend time waiting and praying waiting and praying for this empowerment that Jesus said he would send, this Holy Spirit who was going to come and empower them for the mission. And then all of a sudden, when they're all together, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that was promised to them. It descends on them like tongues of fire that represent God's presence. This image of fire from the Old Testament we know shows up when God does like burning on Mount Sinai, and God shows up there in their midst as they are one together in prayer. And they begin to do crazy things. They start speaking. It's, it's the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after Passover. So tons of the nations, proselytes, uh, religious people that, that, that loved God were, were in town in Jerusalem, left over from the Passover. They're still there. And, and, and from this upper room, the Spirit descends, and these people, they begin to speak in different languages. And there are all these, like, you know... <laughs> um, uh, these small town people that are all from like this little place called Galilee, right? They're all like a bunch of hillbillies, right? But they're speaking in languages that there's no way they could have known. And there's all these people listening in and they're proclaiming the mighty deeds of God in the languages of other people that are there visiting. And so obviously there's this commotion that starts coming together and, and people are gathering around like, what's going on, right? And I don't know what you would think is going on, but some of the people are like, man, they're just drunk, right? This gibberish, what's going on here? And this guy, Peter, he now steps up and he kind of takes this position among the disciples that are there and he says, guys, they're, they're not drunk. It's not even nine in the morning, okay? That's not the option here. What's going on is that God has come. He's descended to be with his people. This is the fulfillment of the promises that he said that God would come and be among us and we would experience community with him. These mighty deeds of what God has done to share with one another. And the climax of Peter's first sermon here um, is proclaiming who Jesus is. Look with me at Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Peter says, towards the end of his sermon, he says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let all the people know this is who Jesus is. Is. He is Lord 
and Christ. And now when the people heard this, they were cut to heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, like, brothers, what do we do? So Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, it's for your children, it's for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And then with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And then those who received his word, they were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I mean, the first church here is a mega church. 3,000 people out of the middle of nowhere suddenly have this new community where they share a common experience. It's been proclaimed to them who Jesus is and what he did, and they believe in him. It says that they received his, his words about who Jesus is and what he did. And then this new community, they get baptized. It's this public declaration that they are associating themselves with Jesus Christ that there has been an inward change in their heart where they've died to Christ and been raised to new life, and they're part of this new community, a community that here is clearly driven by the Holy Spirit. God is there present with them, and the Spirit is administering to them the benefits of the gospel, the benefits of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the same benefits that are, that are here on the table for you guys this morning, and the death of Jesus Christ that your sins have been paid for, you have been forgiven and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that new life is open for you. This, this selfishness, isolation, individualism, all these things focused on self can be put away, and you are now a new creation to experience life in community with God. And the Holy Spirit is just there with the people, just administering the benefits of this new reality. Forgiveness of their sins and, and new life with God. And the change that, that follows from this is crazy. It's insane. It's not the concoction of like human wit. It's not a bunch of smart people, right? They got together in an office somewhere and, and figured out the right kind of like music and hype. You know, it's not just like emotionally driven. It's not, you know, uh, uh, some smoke machines that really got people pumped about this movement. You know, they didn't just start selling shirts and that sort of thing. It's not the, the stimuli that you would get from like a drug or an addiction to something. It's not that that drives this new community. It's the very presence of God in their midst, and they're submitted to it. And crazy things start to happen when people believe in Jesus and experience God in their midst. And that's what begins to happen in this new community. Look at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So first, they devote themselves. They have a new set of values to which they are 100% sold out. The first one of those values is the apostles' teaching. They want to know more about who Jesus is and what he's done for them. And their hearts are submitted to that truth. And then they're doing this together in fellowship. It's this Greek word you guys have probably heard, koinonia. This idea of like intense, close-knit relationship. I mean, this is the kind of community we're talking about. The real, authentic community that we mentioned earlier. It's this koinonia idea. And it's centered around a few things. The first one is it's centered around breaking bread. What do you think that sounds like? Passover. <laughs> yeah, it's both, I think. The first idea of like the Passover meal, right? Of, um, of doing communion, of when Jesus broke bread and he said, this is my body that's broken for you, my blood that's shed for you. And so this community is getting together and they're remembering the essentials of the gospel that Jesus' body was broken for them and his blood was shed for them and it ushered them into a new covenant relationship with God. So they're getting together and they're doing that, but it's also this idea of breaking bread, of just like, man, eating together, potlucking, barbecuing, right? They're just doing life together, sharing meals with one another. And then at the same time, while they're doing these things, they're praying together. This posture of just complete dependence on God on seeking his will for their lives, on seeking his will for the community at large. They want his guidance. They want God to lead them. And so they're in prayer together. And in verse 43, awe came upon every soul. 
Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. There's this conscious awareness that God is at work in their midst. And miraculous things are happening by the hands of the apostles to authenticate the message about who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. Verse 44, all who believed, they were together. They had all things in common. I mean, they're they're selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. This new set of values begins to shift away from who they were to who they're becoming. They're living distinct lives marked by godliness and generosity here. Not focused in on themselves, they're focused instead on others. And it's this mark of unity, care for the needs of other people. They had all things in common, right? Like share the Christmas gifts, guys, right? Like no one had any need, it tells us in chapter four, that was among them. All things in common. It's not this idea of like communism or or socialism. Instead, it's this voluntary self-abandonment to any material possessions for the benefit of other people. They're voluntarily giving up everything that they have to look after the needs of other people. That's what this community looks like. And these new values, it begins to change their lives. It transforms marriages. It it changes what they consider is important. I mean, how they spend their time, how they bought their groceries, down to the smallest details of a budget. It's transformed by this new community with God and with one another. When they believe in Jesus and what he's accomplished, all of these things begin to change. It reframes the purpose of their lives, their stuff, their time, their calendars. Everything begins to take on new color in this kind of a community. There's not a needy person among them. The story goes on, chapter 2, verse 46. Day by day, they're attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They receive their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Church, here's a community that is marked by sacrificial generosity. In full color of joy and celebration, they're made distinct by their acts of worship. I mean, they even have favor with those who are outside the congregation, outside of the church, in the community. And because of that, they're experiencing, by God's blessing, this rapid growth. Because they're living in community with God and with one another. That's what biblical community can look like. One of the problems, though, is that this does not come naturally. I mean, the sin which so easily entangles us continues to pull us back to the self-focus. The author of Hebrews writes this. It's one of the rare uses of the English word habit in the Bible. They made a habit of something bad. Listen to this. Hebrews 10. Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. See, it seems within the church that the author here is addressing that some had made it a habit of isolating themselves, a habit of neglecting the rest of the body, a habit of avoiding other people, a habit of seeing them, you know, down one grocery aisle and going down the other one, right? They're neglecting to meet together. They're not gathering in the temple daily. They're not gathering house by house. They're choosing instead to focus on themselves and to isolate themselves. And we do this because we don't want other people to challenge us. We don't want them to challenge those areas in our lives where we're choosing to live in sin, where we're focusing in on ourselves with our time, our talents, and our treasures instead of focusing on other people. So the author of Hebrews says, guys, spur one another on. It's this word that's used in the idea of like a convulsion, of like shake violently. Or I think the NIV uses the word spur, like S-P-U-R, like you would spur a horse, right? Like you're literally to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Don't let people get away with neglecting the body or or isolating themselves or or focusing in on themselves. It's, It's the responsibility of the whole to focus on every part of the body, to pull each other in back to community with God and with one another. And why? 
Because church, this is essential to God's essence. Eternity past and eternity future. God is a God who lives in community. The purpose for our existence is that he's invited us to experience that community with himself and restored community with one another. Over these next couple weeks, we're going to be taking our time to dive into the distinctives of what this community does together that we see here in the early church. Because church, I want our church to be marked by these same things. That we would be a church that gathers together to learn. A church that gathers together to learn. It's, it's the reason we've done the equipping classes that we have, that we come here on Sunday mornings to hear the word of God preached, that we do academy on Wednesday nights. It's a community that we come together to hear about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. We gather to learn. We gather to fellowship. We hang out. We talk about who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives. We do that here. We do that Monday through Saturday. That we live in fellowship with one another. We gather to scatter because this community is propelled on a mission to see other people invited back into relationship and community with God and others. A reality that only belief in who Jesus is and what he has come to accomplish can actually bring about. And it's a community that gathers to give and to serve because we have transformed values. Over the next couple weeks, these are the things that we're going to get to dive in to as a community with one another. In the meantime, though, what does this look like today? I mean, it's easy to think of the big picture in which the, the, the whole church could be transformed to this kind of a community with God and others just overnight. But what can it look like right now? Church, there's people sitting next to you on your left and on your right. There's people in front of you and behind you. People that are in community with God What if it were so simple as inviting them out to lunch? Taking someone out to lunch after service and just talking about who Jesus is to you. In in the sense of what has Jesus done in your life? What have you gotten to learn about who Jesus is? Who has Jesus been in history? Who is Jesus and what has he accomplished? And just talk about that. And then spend time, you know, after you down your burger, whatever it is, your chili dog, right? Spend time just praying together. Pray for them. Pray with them. Pray for this community. Pray that we could be this kind of people. That we wouldn't settle for any sort of pseudo community. We call each other buddy. But that we would live out real and authentic community. Like God lives in. He invites us in that we could experience that with one another. Would you guys pray with me? Holy Father, a God who dwells in unapproachable light, a God of of holiness, a God whose holiness is is so distinct and, and powerful that we in our sin cannot even draw near to you. God, you have made a way to bring us back into fellowship with you that our sins have been paid for, that we are made holy and righteous, not for ourselves, not for some security ticket out of hell, but Lord, that we might live a quality of life with you now and forevermore of knowing you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent on our behalf to rescue us from our sin and selfishness. God, we understand from your word that the kingdom of heaven, though it is still coming, yet it is here, and we can live in that spiritual kingdom even now in our community with one another. Father, teach us to love you like you love us. Teach us to love our neighbor like you loved yours. Would you train us in righteousness, the kind of lives that give everything of our own, even to humiliation and suffering so that other people could come and and experience life with you? Would you change our hearts as we sing, Lord, that our hands would be open, our hearts surrendered to who you are and what you would do in our lives, even this morning, even after service, we pray in your big name. Amen.